content and spoiler warning for the entire game of Darkwood. It's cool and like 10 hours long. Check it out if you think you like it. Also, as usual, credit to the wiki and the subreddit for details, information, and help with the lore. As the pale moon cast an eerie glow upon the twisted branches, the foreboding forest of Darkwood stirred with a malevolent energy. The trees in this part of the forest oozed with white goo that carried the plague that turned animals and people into monsters, such as the human spider and the human-sized centipedes. The darkness of nighttime would bring the spirits and the horrors of the forest, which would tear the protagonist apart if he didn't get to the protective fumes and the generator-powered lights of the safe house. Each step into its depths felt like a descent into a realm where time and sanity unraveled and the line between nightmares and reality blurred into a surreal nightmare scape and the air grew heavy with the weight of unspoken dread. The being's influence had corrupted the entire forest, creating its own monstrous ecosystem with the spreading of the plague. Very few of the villagers have survived and they've had to resort to extreme measures. Others have been fully taken over by the fungal infestation or simply replaced by the forest. All these aberrations and corruptions have made the forest a maze of constantly twisting roads, persistent fog, and thunderous darkness. Where the night hides, things better left in the darkness. Welcome to Darkwood. Number one on our list for today is the intro or prologue. A good intro sets up the mood and sets expectations for the game, letting the player know what they can expect from the gaming experience. Deadwood throws us into the bleakness of its tail right away with the prologue. During the prologue, you control someone known simply as the doctor. We see him as he goes about his day to day in his cabin in the dark forest evidence of his medical work and experiments litter the room. A radio rests on the floor in the room next door, cages and dirty instrumentation scattered across his desk and his bedroom. He had been doing his best to answer the call of help from the village to try to hold back the plague that was spreading and corrupting people, animal, and plant life alike. This forest had become a kink in the natural order. Venturing out of the cabin, the doctor finds his sick and dying dog and decides to put it out of its misery. A little further down the road, he finds the protagonist unconscious and on the road, possibly one of the only outsiders to have survived an attack by the savages. The doctor appears infuriated with the protagonist and takes him back to his cabin, ties him up to a chair, and very politely asks him where is the key. The key that will unlock the only path out of the forest that's left via an underground tunnel blocked by a heavily armored metal door. The key was the only salvation to this perpetually encroaching darkness that had been spreading across this once peaceful forest. Switching control over to the protagonist, we get the first introduction to what happens to the forest at night, refueling the generator and witnessing how the night has transformed the radio on the floor. The protagonist will eventually fall to the night and later be awoken in the forest by the traitor, which leads us neatly to the next item on our list. Number two, the gas-masked traitor. Saving the protagonist from the doctor and the darkness of the night in the prologue, the traitor is the first friend the protagonist will make on his journey to retrieve the key to the armored door that the doctor stole from him. Appearing as a merchant every morning, he would be a vital lifeline of resources at first. He also tries to give you an early warning on the dangers that inhabit the forest, saying that survivors need to stick together, mute or at least quiet, and wearing a gas mask to protect himself from the spores and fumes of the forest. He will write out what he wants to communicate on his arm and glove using a piece of charcoal. His speech is impossible to hear through his thick mask. The protagonist will notice that he is unnaturally pale and his chest is covered in a mushroom growth and his mask appears to have fused with him. Irregardless, 
The Traitor is a welcome sight for the duration of Chapter 1. By the time the protagonist reaches Chapter 2, the body of the merchant will be found outside the swamp hideout when starting Chapter 2. The words liar sketched on his now severed helmet. Searching his body, the protagonist will find copies of items he had on the traitor, but these copies would be white and moldy. A common theory is that he is a clone or a replica of the protagonist, created by the being who is behind the forest's transformation. The traitor might be one of the many copies of life that the forest would produce. And speaking of copies of life produced in this forest, we move on to number three, the Wolfman. There are a few friends to be found in these woods, but the Wolfman is one of them. Likely another replica created by the forest. He'll always refer to the protagonist as Meek. He is a source of resources and direction in the early game. The wolf can be found in his camps in the silent woods and the dry meadows. Once he thinks you are worthy and might actually survive in the woods, he'll send the protagonist to get the key covered in chicken feces, which grants access to the chicken lady and the pretty lady's home in the village. Giving him this key would have unfortunate consequences for the pretty lady, who had been the target of the wolfman's cannibalistic instincts and attention. If the protagonist doesn't deliver the key to the wolfman, the wolfman would take his revenge by raiding the swamp safe house and taking supplies while the protagonist is away. In the swamp area, at the end of the game, the protagonist will find the abandoned hunter's house where a corpse can be found bound and covered in roots. This body is believed to be the original body of the wolfman, which the bean copied spawning the wolfman that we've encountered. Number four, the savages. Along with the dogs, the savages are some of the first threats the protagonist will encounter in the forest. Savages are regular villagers or hunters that have lost their mind and fallen to the plague. They look sickly with gray pale skin and muddy looking bodies. Some will be hostile, some will be passive. They can use simple weapons like rocks and sticks, and they are found throughout the early areas of the journey. They can be easily manageable threats if the protagonist is prepared. Dangerous in groups, especially if they are attacking the hideout at night. The savages appear to be speech impaired, only communicating in guttural noises and moaning. Throughout the forest, the protagonist will find fallen tree trunks with deep bite marks. The savages have adapted to their new conditions and are able to heal by eating wood, the flesh of trees. The nasty savages will be a constant reminder to the protagonist of what the corruption of this forest can do. Nighttime. One of the centerpieces of Darkwood's mechanics is surviving the night. The nights in the forest are far more dangerous than the days. The terror of the forest manifesting more as the concentration of spores in the air increases and the sun sets. The protagonist will have to make sure he makes it back to the safety of a safe house before dark. Fuel for the generators will have to be procured during the day in order to keep the lights on. Light, along with the protective fumes of the oven, are the only way the protagonist will survive the night without being gored by the night terrors. It's during the night when the game's audio really shines. The combination of anticipation and foreboding, listening to the sounds of monsters stalking outside your door, makes for some of the most tense and pants-pooping experiences in Darkwood. Each night, a different set of threats and challenges will manifest. The first few nights, the threats will be minor and simple to survive. A small dog, savages, that don't seem too motivated to break in, or furniture moving around on its own. But the threats will progress as time goes on. The floor will manifest holes and mushrooms. Packs of aggressive dogs will spawn. Multiple armed savages will appear and break down your barricades. Banshees, ghost invasions, and even the lights faltering and failing. At the end of the game, you'll have to contend with groups of large dogs red chompers and centipedes attacking the safe house and making short work of your preparations. As each night presents its unique challenges, you'll have the time to sit in the corner, quietly listening to the sounds of the night, hoping 
they don't notice you and just move on as you can feel your blood pressure rising. The Eternal Wedding One of the early random events that may occur overnight is a simple knocking on the door. If the protagonist investigates the knock, they'll find an invitation. This invitation is a simple, colorful child's drawing inviting the protagonist to the nearby celebration behind a cornfield at the edge of the dry meadow. Getting past the chained dog outside, the protagonist will see signs of the festivities from the outside. Bright streamers hung up over a courtyard, colorful decorations, and tables for party goers will be found on the inside. In the center of the courtyard, the bride may be found in her ghost form, forever dancing and spinning to a song and music that we can't hear, eternally stuck in what should have been one of her happiest memories. The entire event stands in stark juxtaposition to everything else currently found in the forest. The groom will also be found here, yelling that he's been waiting for you. Once the lights flicker, go on and off, a red chomper in a wedding suit will attack the player screaming, dance with me. After dealing with the chomper, the protagonist wonders if the bride had met a kinder fate than the now monstrous groom that has been transformed into a chomper. A sad story of what would have been a beautiful wedding. Number seven, the sow, or the mother of all pigs. While the plague spread and the trees blockade the roads out of the forest, some villages and their townsfolk were trapped in the forest and had to find a way to survive their new circumstances. The main source of food for the village became pork, or a form of pork. The sow was a giant mutated pig of unknown origins, capable of mass birthing pigs for slaughter. The mother of all pigs was cared for by the pig farmer, since only he knew how and what to feed her. The pig farmer had wired the sow up to electrical cables connected to a generator. During feeding time, he would use electricity to stun the sow and force feed her, giving her the nutrition needed to keep birthing piglets to feed the village. One day, the villagers murdered a woman's entire family. This woman, called Hanuska, took revenge on the village by destroying its food source. She had killed the pig farmer and cut the cables needed to stun and force feed the sow. Doing this would prevent the sow from birthing any more piglets due to a lack of nutrition and thus starving the village. The protagonist has the option to end the matter completely by removing the safeguards on the electrical lever and turning up the voltage fed to the sow. The increased voltage would fry the pig instead of just stunning it. Insert bacon joke here. Sometime later, the now burnt carcass of the giant mother of all pigs will be found in the village as the desperate starving villagers are praying to it like a god, lamenting the loss of their food source and waiting for the famine to take them all. I say this as a lover of sausage and bacon, but the sow and its entire situation is pretty nasty. 8. The Chicken Lady and the Pretty Lady Entering the last village in the forest, the protagonist will be reminded of how horrifying he looks and that the villagers don't want him there. In the outskirts of the village, the home of the chicken lady and the pretty lady will be found. The same home that the wolfman is obsessed with getting a key for. The chicken lady appears exactly how the name suggests, an elderly lady that keeps a lot of chickens in her home, like an avian equivalent of a cat lady. She shares her home with her sister, the pretty lady. Speaking to the chicken lady, she would tell the protagonist about a musician boy that is obsessed with the pretty lady and will stand outside her home for hours playing his violin in hopes of impressing the pretty lady. The chicken lady can't stand it and asks the protagonist to get rid of the musician and stop the music. She probably enjoys the quiet. If the protagonist makes his way into the locked part of the house, he'll get a glimpse of what's become of the pretty lady that the wolfman and the musician seem so obsessed with, though for different reasons. It's clear the plague has gotten to her, distorting her body into this bioarboreal mutation. She's grown large and her skin has become more wood-like, 
and now she's bound to her bed. The fate of the chicken lady and the pretty lady will depend on the choices the protagonist makes, but one way or the other, there are very few happy endings in this dark forest. The Chompers The Chompers will be the bane of the protagonist after the initial parts of his escape from the forest. They are mutated humans who have been transformed by the final stages of the plague. The Chompers have grown a large mouth down the center of their heads and torso, tearing them into two. The Chompers are very aggressive and quick. They will follow the protagonist across the forest without relenting. They will ambush the protagonist more than once and will be a significant combat challenge. It's best to fight them with shovels and axes. Their giant mouths also make them great for breaking down barricades and are particularly dangerous at night when they'll break in faster than most other monsters. After hitting them a few times, the human part of them, the legs, will then fall off. The chompers will then proceed to drag themselves by their arms, trying to bite the protagonist and will have to be put down again. They are indeed truly nasty little fellas. The train wreck dream or the doctor's side of the story. In his mission to get the key to the underground tunnel back from the doctor who stole it in the prologue, the protagonist will eventually arrive at the train wreck in the old woods. Here, the doctor will spring a trap on the protagonist. Locking the protagonist in the train car, it will start to fill with a nauseous gas, knocking the protagonist out. The protagonist would then have a dream and hallucinate events from the doctor's past and find out why the doctor seems to hate the protagonist so much. In the visions, the protagonist sees the doctor's agony as he tries to answer the call to care for the villagers who had caught the plague. He was helpless to stop the infections and its effect on the people that he knew. He watched more and more of them gradually turn more and more wood-like and sickly and he could do nothing about it. The doctor seems to plague the protagonist for the breakout of the plague. Not sure why, but the villagers seem to agree that he is the cause of this chaos. Eventually in the dream, a black chomper will attack the protagonist. Surviving this attack or not will dictate the role that the doctor will play in the second half of the game. 11. The Man Halfway through the ordeal, after the protagonist confronts the doctor in the train wreck. The protagonist will get the chance to go through the armored underground door that is supposed to lead to the path home, the way out of the forest. Going underground, the protagonist gets to see how the corruption of the beam and the plague have seeped its way underground, corrupting life and blocking off pathways in the tunnel. It's in one of these tunnels where the protagonist will encounter the man, or at least that's how the wiki calls him, since he doesn't have an in-game name. In one of the dead ends, the shape of a man being absorbed into the root system will talk to the protagonist. The man struggles to get up, not realizing he is part of the roots and is attached. He asks us who we are, tells us that he wants to go home. He had tried to escape the forest, but he says that there was a talking tree blocking the road home the only way out of the forest. He then mentions that he has a headache and proceeds to reach into his skull through a hole, pushing his hand deeper into his skull. The hole expands as part of his skull breaks and chips away. He pulls his hand out of his own head, holding a soft bullet covered in the white goo the infected trees secrete and hands the soft bullet to you. He says that this is the bullet that put him to sleep. He drops his head and stops moving. Number 12. The Mushroom Men Mushrooms are plentiful and easy to find in all parts of the forest. In the first part of the game, we get used to keeping an eye out for them to either harvest them or simply to avoid stepping on the poisonous ones. This takes a turn in Chapter 2, where we meet the Mushroom Men in the swamp. Sometimes, some of the piles of mushrooms scattered around will actually be able to sit up and pursue the protagonist. The mushroom men will lay in wait for the player in the swamp, and once the protagonist is near, they will stand up and chase the player, leaving an imprint in the grass where they were waiting. 
after pursuing the player for a short amount of time, they'll explode, destroying themselves and anything around it. After the explosion, mushroom gore and juice will be found scattered around, leaving a nasty little scene. The forest has eyes. They say that the forest has eyes in Darkwood, and those eyes are giant and in the ground. The forest also has these other moist holes in the ground that tentacles come out of. Some theorize that these might be attached or somehow connected to the being, the entity behind all of this corruption, serving as a form of video surveillance system for the being to monitor everything in the forest. Two forms of these growths are benign, the eyes and the tentacles. The tentacles won't react to the protagonist, but the eyes will hide and close when the protagonist is nearby. Another, more hostile form of the growths are the red glares. These will be found throughout the forest and sometimes manifest overnight during the nightly hauntings. Getting too close to them will trigger this ear screeching sound which will hurt the protagonist, so he's best off keeping his distance. The presence of the growth will be a constant reminder to the protagonist that it is surrounded by forces of nature beyond his comprehension. Also, it's considered rude to step on someone's eyes. Number 14, the giant snail. When the protagonist awakens in the swamp for the first time, there'll be two locations of interest marked on the map, the talking tree and the cottage near the junkyard. Approaching the cottage near the junkyard, the landscape would change to a mostly white color as more and more of the goo covers the landscape. Giant mushroom clusters appear to be connected by organic white cords crisscrossing the forest floor in this area. The mushrooms call for you to hear her. Approaching the cottage, we see what has become of its formerly human inhabitant, a giant snail that slithers into a giant shell perched on top of what used to be its cabin. Speaking with the snail, he will promptly tell the protagonist how ugly he is and explain how he needs help to be freed. The snail is a replica of the man that used to live in this house who had been trapped in the forest and had to resort to eating snails to survive and had taken to trying to record a sound that the being made in the forest. It's believed he died before the events of the game, and after he died, with time, he was enveloped and consumed by roots, triggering the cloning process, which spawned a giant snail that then moved into the old man's house. The snail initially hides from the protagonist, but when approached, seems very willing to talk. The snail will ask the protagonist to help free him. He had spent enough time in the cottage and desired freedom to roam the forest. The snail will ask the protagonist to cut the organic cords outside. The next day, the snail will not be found at the cottage, having made his way to the nearby radio tower. Though friendly and polite, the snail is a pretty nasty inhabitant of this cursed forest. 15. The Mushroom Granny. I can fix her colorful character in this drab forest is the mushroom granny, demonstrating that adding granny to things can make them creepier. Skin granny, mushroom granny, table granny, hammer granny, cookies and ice cream granny, sexy granny. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. The mushroom granny is the grandmother of the elephants, a young family that has managed to survive the breakout of the plague. The elephants will help you in your quest to escape the forest if you are able to return a child to them. A child that is in the mushroom granny's locked room. The mushroom granny will want a favor in exchange of releasing the child to your custody. She tells you that recently some groups of desperate villagers have been raiding the mushroom glades causing her trouble. The protagonist will have the option to go to the quarry to deal with them or just lie to her. If the protagonist heads to the quarry, he'll find that the vast majority of the villagers are sick and dying, with only a few healthy ones left to react to the protagonist's arrival. The protagonist will have the option to destroy the support, holding up a boulder and sealing all of the villagers in, dooming any chance of survival they might have had, and deepening the impression the village survivors have 
that the protagonist is actually a monster of the forest. After dealing with the villagers, the mushroom granny will release the child to the protagonist and allow him to rejoin his siblings and mother and putting the protagonist one step closer to the road home, the only way out of the forest past the talking tree. Though, there is one last thing the protagonist will be able to do before continuing on his journey and leaving the mushroom granny's home. Having dealt with business, the protagonist starts to notice the sweet scent of mushrooms coming from the old lady, so he eats her. 16. The Human Spiders The name itself compels one to find out more about this testament to body horror. The Human Spider will grace the protagonist with his presence towards the end of his journey in the swamp, where the protagonist meets the talking tree and finds the road home. The Human Spider is a quick enemy that will ambush the protagonist when he is exploring. It will attack by ripping off one of its many human limbs and throw it at the protagonist before closing distance and attacking in close range. While fighting the human spider, the protagonist may not notice what happens that the human spider threw as it suddenly starts growing and expanding and the freshly ripped off limb starts expanding into a freshly spawned second human spider. The human spider can reproduce itself entirely from a single limb. While a single human spider poses enough of a threat, being attacked by a second one is never a situation that you'd like to find yourself in. Fortunately, they are individually a little weak, falling to a single hit from a sharpened axe. Smash. The Banshees in the Radio Tower. The protagonist will have to explore the Radio Tower if he is to burn the talking tree and get access to the road home. What will surprise the protagonist is the fact that Banshees has set up their nest in the Rado Tower. Arriving at the Rado Tower, it appears like what you'd expect from an abandoned facility left to the elements. Going deeper into the tower, the protagonist will find who are the new residents of this Rado Tower, finding a few fully grown banshees and dozens of babies. The adult banshees will try to hurt and disorient the protagonist with their high-pitched wailing. The babies would try to swarm the protagonist with raw numbers. If the protagonist is to find the components to fix the oxygen machine, he'll have to find a way to deal with them, either through brute force or other ways of dealing with crowds of monsters. Dealing with a swarm of baby monsters and screeching horrors would be a nasty experience for anyone in these cursed dark woods. 18. Burning the Talking Tree The protagonist is ultimately looking for a way out of the forest, and his escape would be the road home, the only known path from the interior of the forest to the outside world. The road home is blocked by a massive pulsating tree, the talking tree. The talking tree is an amalgamation of many different people and a cow whose faces are visible on the trunk of the tree. These ghostly apparitions are clones or copies of people and a cow that have been absorbed into the being via its root network that spread across the forest. Attempting to speak to any of these individual things will be fruitless since it's impossible to make out any single voice. All of these things are vocalizing and mumbling, making the tree talk with a constant unintelligible barrage of sounds. To get access to the road home, the protagonist will have to swim underneath the tree and set fire to it, burning it down to ashes. The fire would be so massive that it takes an entire day for it to extinguish. At this point, the protagonist will go back to the shelter to wait out the night. On this last night, the protagonist will have a unique event at night when the talking tree talks to the protagonist over the radio, asking him why he did it. Why did he burn the talking tree? The radio will then combust into flames and start spawning flaming villagers to kill the protagonist. The next day, the protagonist will walk through a cloud of ashes and now he can finally take the road home and escape this awful forest. Finally, a way out of here. 19. The Road Home Walking through the burnt out husk of the talking tree, the protagonist finally escapes the forest. After this entire journey, at long last, the way home. Traveling along this road 
he will see others that tried and failed to make his same journey, people frozen in place by the white goo covered roots of the forest. They have made it so close to escaping the woods. A little bit further up the road, we finally see concrete and blockhouses, evidence of civilization, safety. The neighbors look unsurprised to see the protagonist and are even friendly to him for once. Hopscotch, a merry-go-round, signs of a regular boring life and what the protagonist has been trying to get back to since the start of his ordeal. Finally, he had escaped. Finally, he'd be able to rest once more once he got back to his apartment. But something didn't feel right. Before going back to his apartment, the protagonist is drawn to a radio in his basement. A radio that at some point oddly seems to make the lights dim and tells him to go back to sleep. Walking the halls, he has a weird encounter with two of his neighbors. Is he imagining things? Walking down the hall, approaching his apartment, something isn't right. Reality seems to be bending. Is he snapping under the stress of everything he went through? The further he walks into the hallway, which seems to go on and on forever, the more and more the roots seem to manifest and take over this hallway. How long had he walked? How was there root growth here? Finally, he enters the soothing familiarity of his apartment. Rest at long last. He puts on his favorite Taylor Swift album to relax. Here, you get to pet the only good dog in the game, Zurek. He's a cutie, a good puppy. Maybe it was all over and the protagonist could finally get some much deserved rest. After so many days and nights of constant vigilance against the horrors of the forest, the protagonist might be able to finally close his eyes and get some sleep. But of course, we are only on number 19 on this list, so we know it's not over. Exploring the apartment, the protagonist notices evidence of root growth in his apartment. Using a screwdriver, tool, not the drink, to rip up the floorboards, he reveals a network of pulsating roots, just like in the forest. He never escaped. He never escaped the being, the entity behind all this. He hadn't truly escaped the forest. He was still trapped. Exploring underneath the bed, on which he really wanted to sleep, he finds a dark hole. He has no option but to investigate. The protagonist descends into the hole underneath his bed. Number 20. The Bean and the End of Our Story The protagonist wakes up on the floor in the hollow trunk of a colossal giant tree. He is naked and surrounded by other bodies, his clothes scattered nearby. The other people here are in fetal position rocking back and forth, telling us to go back to sleep, to not get up, don't fight, give in. Exploring the area, the protagonist finds the bright beating heart of the tree, the Bean the entity that had caused all this. The monstrous tree at the center of everything that had happened to him, and so many more, is surrounded by still bodies and some worshiping this arboreal god. The entity is feeding on these poor people's bodies that he had lured down here, consuming them as they slept. Nearby, we find a body holding something, a metallic object, ripping it away from the half-living body the protagonist finds a flamethrower. It was easy to figure out what he had to do next. The protagonist realizes that there isn't going to be an escape for him or anybody else here, but the bean must be burned. To put an end to this nightmare once and for all, to an extent he enjoyed it, burning this son of a bitch down, finally getting some payback. Let it all burn down. The epilogue tells us that the fire burned for days, hundreds of square miles of the forest, burning in a firestorm that tore through the forest after the bean was burned down, putting an end to the dark forest and everything in it. The nightmare was over at last, as the land was purified 
by the fire. And that's my video on 20 nasty things in Darkwood. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, I appreciate your support. Take care, I hope you are well, and later.